Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all and maybe some others will join us. To first, I'd like to welcome uh, Franz Tarmudi from Heinrich Boll Foundation, Southeast Asia office to share a little bit about our network and help open up the session today. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Uh, greetings, everyone. Yeah, I see the participant all the way from United States, India, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and also uh, Sri Lanka. So my name is Franz Tarmedi. I'm from Indonesia, but been based in Thailand for 10 years. I work with the Heinrich Bull Foundation. It's a German political foundation. We work on uh, environment, uh, climate change, also about agriculture policy. So let me introduce you a bit about <clears throat> our um, network, APIA, the Asia Pollinator Initiatives Alliance. This is um, our network. Um, oh, sorry, before that, I would also introduce about, um, I, I would say thank you for the organization that support today event, the WWF Thailand, Go Organic Space International, Earthnet Foundation, and our volunteers. As you know, today we will have a talk about Apisirana and Bee Friendly Farming with Dr. <coughs> Ranjit Pasanta Kumara Kunchihewa from Sri Lanka. And then let me introduce a bit about APIA. Our network is an initiative started in early 2020. Uh, this is uh, came up from our love and interest about the pollinators and how to make, how to restore pollinators in our life. Yeah, because it's very important. The objective is definitely to connect like-minded people like you who are, who are joining today an organization in Asia to raise public awareness for pollinator protection as well as sharing knowledge and resources. This is a um, relative new network and everybody are open, welcome to join. How to join? You can also visit our Facebook group for information and networking. This is a private group, so uh, you should register. Uh, easy way to register, you can type tiny.cc slash APIA, and then it will go to our Facebook group. Please register and then also spread to your network and uh, friends. Um, before moving back to uh, Michael to introduce Dr. Kunchi, I would share a bit about our work in SEC Atlas from our head office in Berlin. Uh, this is a recent publication, facts and figures about friends and foes in farming. Uh, it covers um, whole variety of issue. And then there is one article from Southeast Asia written by Eric Gernan, our uh, member of the uh, network as well. To download this for free, you can also go to tiny.cc slash insectatlas. I repeat again, tiny.cc slash insectatlas. Also fit, visit our website uh, for more um, information and articles. Uh, some of our network member contributed uh, articles on our website. Last slide, on our Insect Atlas, you can see a lot of interesting infographics like this one is about the distribution of honeybees in Southeast Asia and also um, a small insect on honey production in selected countries in Southeast Asia. So I would also encourage um, everybody to visit uh, and download the Insect Atlas because um, it will be a kind of interesting contribution, especially for Southeast Asia there's uh, not so many publication focusing on um, pollinators and bees at the moment. Yeah, I think that's all from my side. I send it over to Michael uh, without further ado to introduce our uh, speaker. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Franz, for, for uh, setting us off. Just to let everyone know, the, the planned program for today is uh, we'll hear a presentation from uh, Dr. Punchi Hewa and then uh, welcome question and answer, which I prefer people to use the chat initially, and I'll, I'll read the questions so we can move those. Would be questions that would be related to his presentation and experience. And, uh, and I'm sorry if I don't get your name correctly pronounced exactly, but uh, please bear with that. And then uh, after that, at the end of the hour, we want to try to create a little bit more exchange and network, and I think uh, allow Dr. Punchi Hewa to ask questions of our participants or other discussion, I think particularly around the area of, of bee-friendly farming. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome 
uh, Dr. Ranjit Wasanta Kumara Punchihewa, who was born and raised in a rubber plantation house with a home garden that made his family self-sufficient in all their food and healthcare needs with cattle and several beehives that supplied honey for the household. This was when Ceylon was still a sleepy green island with wide forest cover. His interest in bees was fostered by his grandparents' farm, where his grandmother cared for the bees in simple hives, which supplied him and his siblings with honey used for food and traditional medicine. Later in his childhood experiences were brought to life in his university days, university days where his entomology teacher, Professor Bruce Albert Baptist, taught him systematically about honeybees. During his undergraduate days, he was introduced to a young scientist couple, Dr. Nicolas and Gudrun Koniger of Germany, who were postdoctoral scientists in Sri Lanka. As he was graduating, he was a fully fledged Apisarana beekeeper and a Canadian professor, G.F. Townsend, initiated an apiculture development project in Sri Lanka with his teacher and with him as the research assistant. He had his formal training in pollination ecology at University of Guelph in Canada. His continuing professional interactions with Professor Nico Koninger at University of Frankfurt gave him the chance to study the mating behavior of Apis mellifera in Europe and to apply similar principles to Apis serrana in Sri Lanka for them to understand its mating behavior and that of Asian honeybees. This work led to an, an, the understanding of management problems for Apis serrana and solutions. Then in 1995, he presented this work to the world to recognize Apis serrana as a commercial species. He had traveled to many Asian countries to meet rural beekeepers and learn from them. He was a Fulbright Fellow in the USA and is presently the chairman of the Pollinator Conservation Working Group of Sri Lanka. He's equally at home both with Apis mellifera and Apis serrana beekeeping, but convinced with reason that the well-adapted indigenous honeybees are much more suitable in the long term for evergreen tropical Asian rural farmers. This suitability is not only due to the ecological adaptability of these honeybees, but also due to the cultural recognition of the local honey as a highly valuable food and medicinal ingredient. Input intensive modern farming has become highly detrimental to indigenous honeybees and therefore devising bee friendly farming systems has become an important agenda in his beekeeping promotion activities. Retiring from the Department of Agriculture in 2002, he joined University of Rahuna and taught until the end of 2014. His formal retirement has really been a transition to working full time in the T. Sabi Institute, which he established in 2001 for the conservation and utilization of bees for sustainable development. So without further ado, I'd most like to welcome uh, Dr. Punchihewa. Thank you. Can I start? All right, welcome. You want your slides up? Should we put your slide up or not yet? Yeah, all right. I just, um, uh, oh. thank you very much. And um, I welcome everybody who are participating to share my interest and my experience with the bees. And, um, uh, yes, I use this slide uh, because now many Asian countries uh, and many countries, they are uh, in their policy making, they are concerned with the protection of plants and everything. And this is um, the, the Sri Lankan national flower, national uh, uh, flower. It's called, a, it's an indigenous flower, a lotus. Uh, it's a green, uh, it's a blue lotus that we call it, a uh, blue lotus of Nil Manel, and uh, it's um, it's a nymphia. And uh, what is important is not the flower, but there's a serana bee on in one of the flowers in the middle, which is the 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 normal hive honey bee. So um, the selection of the national uh, flower also goes very well with the the bees, the honey bees. Uh, and um, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, yes. Even our national tree, Mesua Ferrea, is a huge tree, beautiful tree, and especially it's more beautiful when it's in a new flush. It's uh, almost like a, 
a red flame, the new flush, uh, as you know, in many, many, many plants in the tropics, in the rainforest, they have a very, very uh, impressive uh, uh, new flush. And here it's uh, almost red. And often uh, they compare that to the lips of uh, young women. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is the smallest honeybee is foraging on these large flowers of uh, the national tree. So our selection of national tree and the national flower, I think it's quite timely and, and, and uh, very good, whoever who did it. It's not me, some other uh, senior people at the time did it. So with that, uh, I just want to say that the bees are very common, very common in our uh, tropical environment. And uh, with all my travel and little experience with the uh, many countries in, in the South Asian region, tropical countries. Uh, I've seen bees everywhere, practically everywhere. I mean, um, as you know, um, Bangalore is a big city. I've seen bees, the Dosara bees in Bangalore city. They're quite comfortable with it. And uh, even today, it may be uh, possible to see um, uh, several hives of uh, several uh, nests of Apis Dosara, the giant honeybee in the the big Bangalore post office. People are not bothered. The bees don't bother uh, humans either. And Bangalore is a big city and a busy place. And so in Thailand, I've seen many bees, uh, including um, the Epistoria in heart of the Thai, uh, Bangkok. So they're quite common, but unfortunately, and same in, even in uh, our city, in uh, Colombo, our capital is not so big compared to others, but still, uh, the bees are not too uncommon, at least in the periphery where still there are uh, home gardens. So bees are common, but they are becoming not very common. That's a concern. I'll get to that later. Can we change to the next slide, please? Yes, um, this is rather a complicated, complex diagram, but it's very simple. It all amounts to say that in tropics, the humid tropics, we have the highest biomass production in the world. I mean, any, any country, right from Brazil, Congo, or Asian, wherever there is a humid uh, tropical environment, as you know, there's good sunlight, a lot of water. Of course, the soils are rather rich because the soil has a lot of uh, uh, leaf coverage, leaf litter. The trees just go wild. Uh, as you know, in our countries, you just throw a piece of wood and next day it's a, it's a tree almost. So, um, so we have a very good uh, environment for plant growth and also any other life form. So we are teeming with life in the tropical humid region. So, but when you really take a reductionist approach, I normally don't, but we have to use a a little reduction is approach to understand things. You can uh, split this um, diagram. I'm sure a lot of people cannot read it. I mean, even I can't read it being here, uh, right in front of the screen. The, 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 what, it, what becomes very eminent is the um, pollinators because our forest is so thick, the wind cannot take the pollen very far because uh, the, 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 if you go inside, I'm sure a lot of us have done it. Our rainforest, it's uh, almost like a very hot day. You are, you, are, you are sweating as if you are taking a shower because it's so humid and the, there's no practically air movement. So the same true is for any um, uh, wind-borne pollen. So wind pollination is not a very good thing to take place in the forest. Unless you go to open areas, the grasses are always been pollinated but not, the, not the, the, the large number of thousands of uh, species of trees in the rainforest. So obviously there has to be active pollen carrier, so the animals. So among animals, of course, uh, bees specifically evolved for that purpose. Among bees, uh, the honeybees are rather easy to manage, uh, unlike the many solitary bees, which I will not talk about, but honeybees are rather easy to manage if you offer them a nesting site, and if they are not depleted of food, they will keep on staying. And also, on the other hand, the soil fertility, one of the, one of the indicators of soil fertility 
Maybe you change the next slide that's a little bit enlarged than this one. Please, next slide. Yeah, no, the next one, yeah. So here, the earthworms and the bees, uh, I, I take, I mean, there are so many other indicators. I mean, there can be birds, many, many things, uh, reptiles, uh, everything. But for ordinary person, for a farmer, these are the very, very simple, easy to see indicators, the existence of honeybees and the existence of earthworms, because any farmer will dig the soil. The moment you dig the soil, one sees the earthworms. But um, the picture is changing a little bit uh, in recent times. And uh, you can never see earthworms anymore in some of the best farming areas, so-called best farming areas, where they grow not indigenous vegetables, um, exotic vegetables, we are using a lot of insects, a lot of pesticides and chemical fertilizer. There is the single earthworm. That's, that's really dreadful, I would say. And that's a very clear indicator. We are doing something wrong to the soil, obviously. Chemical fertilizers are killing it. If you take a little baby earthworm soon after birth, if you introduce a grain of sugar, sugar is not poison, the earthworm, the little earthworm will die. It's almost like a thread because the, the osmotic pressure of the dissolving sugar, the little earthworm can't take it up. Just imagine a, a grain of uh, any um, salty or any mineral um, fertilizer. That will kill even the adults. And then we use a lot of insecticides um, among agrochemicals, the three major pesticides, the insecticides, the herbicides, and the, uh, the herbicides and the fungicides. The most potent killer for the insects, overall insects, and the bees are the insecticides. And there are many, I mean, people always advise, the companies will advise, don't spray during the flowering time, but the farmer uh, has no, I mean, he doesn't bother about the flowering time or whatever. And also our farms are very small. As you know, uh, the, the, the South Asia is rather populous and farming areas are rather small and there are no large farms. Uh, of course, Sri Lanka has a different thing. We have this large plantation started during the British colonial times, but those are rubber and tea and, and, and coconut. But, uh, but the agricultural areas which grow food plants are small. So if one sprays in one, uh, one farm, obviously the, there's a drift that carries insecticides to the next farm and all the surrounding area. And that can not only be bees, the, 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 the humans, the children could be get intoxicated. And uh, most of the water gets um, contaminated because uh, somehow, I mean, there's a lot of campaign. Obviously there's a lot of campaign to use insecticides um, carefully and, and that kind of thing. So I'm not going to talk about the agriculture as such adjustments that we have to make. I want to present this, um, our case, to look at the, 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 the common friendly animals in our environment, including bees, and perhaps in the soil, the earthworm. Because if our environment, the aerial environment and soil environment is healthy, then of course you can produce well, because then the, 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 the very character of the tropical, humid tropical forest, the high generation of biomass will work and that will work in favor of us, because the biomass means uh, whatever the food part that you take from a plant. Can we change to the next one, please? Next slide, please. Yes, I mean, this is again very common. I mean, from Indonesia, starting from, let's say from um, uh, Southern India, especially the uh, Nilagiri Hills, um, the Western Ghats, they call it, um, um, uh, parts of uh, state Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala. And uh, from, I mean, that's the only rainforest area I, I, I see in uh, the, the large India, but most of it is more or less uh, uh, not, not humid, uh, ra rather water scarce. But say from Bangladesh and uh, uh, um, Nepal, right up to the end of the Asian continent, um, Indonesia, I think uh, the tropical in, uh, Asia, what you see here is uh, very common. 
all kinds of uh, plants growing, rice, uh, coconuts and fruits, jackfruits and all kinds of the banana. And also in the background, uh, you see all these uh, rainy, uh, humid, uh, uh, misty mountains uh, that adds to the, uh, the, the wetness of the land. And that's very common. And here, this is at a, um, about, uh, this is a picture I've taken at about 70, 70 millimeter um, uh, uh, altitude. So it's, it's almost uh, not, not, not too far from the sea level. So that's why the coconuts and all are growing very well. So this is not even, a, this is practically the plain starting to the mountains. So you can see all these misty things. And this is humid and these are very fertile land. But unfortunately, um, the fertility of the land is uh, wrongly exploited. And uh, you have gone to um, non-compatible crops, which are exotic. And that has uh, you know, led to the overuse of uh, extraneous chemicals. Because uh, obviously, when a plant is not in its um, uh, niche, they have to have support systems. Because uh, if you grow an exotic plant in an uh, exotic place, um, obviously there's an incompatibility comes. So there is, um, it has to be supported by external help, which means fertilizer and, and insecticides and you know, the nature trying to come to you know, stability, which means they, they remove the intruder. Anyway, that's beside the um, presentation. Can you go to the next one, please? Yes, uh, as I said, um, the processes in this complex um, uh, tropical, um, uh, evergreen, evergreen tropical system, the targets are large, but um, uh, the, 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 the processes are very small. Pollen transfer, it's microscopic. And uh, the transfer of uh, microbial spores, microscopic again, but the outcome of that is rather large. You see large trees and, and, uh, and uh, 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 large processes like that. But uh, you know, the, 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 the targets are rather very fine. So, but um, you know, there, there are a lot of work going on. In fact, my teachers and uh, with um, Mr. Uh, Salim Tingek in, um, in uh, Kalimantan uh, produced this honeybees of Bonio. I mean, which they consider as the birthplace of all honeybees. And where there's a lot of variety, I mean, compared to Sri Lanka, we have only four species or five species. Whereas um, in, in, in uh, Borneo, there are, uh, I think more than 30 or nearly 40 species of honeybees, um, whether there's stinglers or stinging bees, uh, many species. Because Sri Lanka, you know, as you see in the map, almost at the very <laughs> end of the receiving, very end of the receiving end. Uh, and also this, um, uh, my collaborator, um, um, Dr. David Rubik from Smithsonian, they worked a long time in Sarawak uh, studies and their book, I mean, they, they, they give the theoretical basis and, um, and uh, Professor Koenig's book uh, gives um, some applications of it. So we are not short of um, uh, uh, studies. So, but you know, these sort of uh, uh, throw in the light to the importance of um, pollination in our tropical system and pollination tropical system means the tropical agricultural system, tropical farming system. In tropics, the, 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 as you know, we cannot separate uh, sometimes the farms and the forests. I mean, farms may be just by the side of the uh, forest. So we have to benefit from this huge, uh, massive uh, uh, biodiversity um, uh, reserve in the forest. So then our farming can, um, can be better because just now, uh, farming has become so-called intensive. That means external resource dependent. So the profits for the farmer is low. So we really have to reinvent our farming. We have to really reinvent our farming. So can I go to the next one, please? Next slide, please. Yes, the humid tropical problems with um, conventional high external input farming. I just very briefly run through it just to remind you, I think this is all well known to us, but still I've, I thought for the sake of completion, I have this. 
Of course, as I said before, we have the highest biomass generation capacity in our environment. So much so, it's something like uh, two kilograms per square meter per year. That's a lot of um, biomass. I mean, dry weight of biomass. Just imagine two kilograms of um, uh, biomass, that's a lot. And also we have the highest biodiversity. Of course, uh, Brazil, Congo, all these countries there. We have very high biomass, uh, biodiversity. And pollination, pollination is one of the things that was brought to limelight after the Rio conference uh, as far back in 1994. That's a good thing. And some of my teachers were really ready for it at the time because there were concerns as far back in 1980s um, when, we, when we were students, when I was students that uh, pollinator declination was a major issue and they took it up seriously. At the time, uh, you know, one of the things that was talked was the acid rain, but now nobody talks about acid rain anymore because things have become worse. But even far back in the time, pollinator conservation was taken a serious thing. So some of my teachers were very ready when they started the Rio Summit then. And also biodata, the soil microbes, soil, soil, soil biota, that also was taken a serious thing because these are the things that um, normal people don't take it too important because it's already there. We think, oh yeah, it's there. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. And, um, but now it has become uh, important and uh, many people, uh, they take it seriously and so much so the policy, uh, agriculture and conservation policies of uh, many countries in the region are taking up uh, these things seriously, which is good. Unfortunately, um, the manpower, trained manpower, manpower to handle things are not, not yet uh, enough, but I'm sure uh, our region will um, take care of it, and especially with uh, conferences like this. However, um, chemical agriculture goes against us, of course, that's well known. And uh, chemical insecticides are destructive to all aerial insects, all, not only even birds, as you know, one great lady scientist who made a real impact um, on uh, environment uh, um, um, uh, as far back in 1960, who wrote Silent Spring, Rachel Carson. In fact, she went, for, uh, went ahead to mention entomologists as a Stone Age scientist because the entomologists uh, really, you know, <laughs> put to the chemical, chemical control of insects. Of course, then there were uh, there were many, many um, uh, great people uh, to join that, and you know, uh, uh, so the bird, uh, bird uh, egg, eggshell thinning was thing that was detected by uh, Dr. Rachel Carson as far back in 1950. So it is only less than 10 years after in, uh, introduction of insecticides. So things have been taking place. I mean, we can't be all that distressed about it. So, but it's not enough. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not enough. People are interested. It's not enough. And soil biota, depletion due to chemical fertilizer. I mean, that's, uh, that's another, another, another uh, factor. Because, uh, I mean, without chemical, uh, without the, uh, the, the, the biological activities of the soil, the soil will not be as fertile as it is. As you know, most of the nutrients in our soil is not in the soil or our, our forest. It's in the tree. It's biologically fixed. Uh, uh, nutrients because they are in the biomass. So therefore, biomass recycling is very, very important. Unless biomass recycling takes place, it's bad for the bees and bad for the earthworms. So re recycling of biomass takes place with a falling leaf. And if the soil is highly eroded, what can you get? Nothing. As you know, the water from a tropical rainforest is as clean as distilled water because all the nutrients are being absorbed into the biomass of everything from big trees up to the micro, uh, you know, small fungi. So in this system, good indicators are earthworms because any of these microbes we are talking about, uh, hardly, you and I can't see it, most of the parts, but unless you, are, you want to do a special microscopic examination and staining and all. Then I'll take a very, very common uh, arthropod, the orbited mites. They are in plenty in our 
uh, soft, uh, you know, uh, humid soils under the litter. But you know, how many of us have seen uh, orbited mites? They are very good indicators, but they're very, very tiny, very tiny. I mean, you need at least a microscope of uh, more than 80 uh, time magnification to see your orbited mite clearly, but they are, they are in large numbers, you know, converting this um, fertility into the soil and recycling. So, but earthworm is a good visual indicator, simple indicator, as much as bees are an indicator. May I go to the next one, please? Yeah. Now, this is the symptom. Very recently, uh, Dr. Mitchell from um, uh, University of New Shadow in, uh, uh, in Switzerland made a very, very good study. And, um, and he analyzed many samples from all over the world to find the insecticide contamination. And this published in Science, as you know, Science is one of the leading uh, magazines in the English speaking world. It comes from uh, the United States, the America. And uh, the other is the nature comes from Britain, the two leading countries speaking English. I mean, uh, so, so the, the, I mean, if you publish in science or um, nature, those are really the, 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 the top level in the English speaking world. So, and in, in, in uh, 19, uh, 2017, First article, a stunning article, three pages, the worldwide survey of neonicotinics, nicotinides in honey. You will be shocking to understand 75% of all honeys are contaminated. Just imagine, I mean, I've seen a report saying that a placental fluid of our mothers are contaminated with glyphosate and various other things. But now it has come to honey, which is considered by, I think all over the world. I know that many traditional people in Europe, in Switzerland and Germany, they consider honey to be somewhat you know, medicinal and, and they use that in, and, and many, even um, I have associated uh, many, uh, 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 let's say my parental generation, Canadians and Americans, they all take honey very seriously. Even in their hardest winters, they, they, they trust on honey and lime. So honey is something world over. I mean, every religion uh, uh, respect honey. But now just imagine you're, take, you're taking toxins with honey. And particularly in Sri Lanka, 80% of the time, the carrier, the activator, the catalyst of our natural medical system is honey. I mean, I should have mentioned in my brief uh, introduction, um, uh, which uh, uh, Michael gave, once I broke my hand, uh, falling from a tree, my, my, my shoulder, the first uh, uh, plant-based um, medicine applied, that plaster was applied to my shoulder. I was about eight, I don't know, about 11 or 12 year kid, you know, the kid that, you know, running, tree climbing kid. And uh, for two weeks, it was applied after mixing with honey. Now that's something I can't even figure out now. You know, this plaster was applied to my shoulder, broken bones, mixed with honey. And I remember as a young, I was in pain, but as a young man, a young boy, I tried to taste it, <laughs> but it was not sweet. Anyway, that's beside the point. The point I'm trying to bring is, in Asian medical system, I'm sure it's everywhere, but I know our medical system, the Sinhalese uh, uh, medical system, I mean, for centuries, thousands of years, they've been using local plants and honey. I mean, they use many other uh, catalysts and actuators, but honey is one of the commonest and the most extensively used. I was going through the pharmacopoeia of the, 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 the Medica Singhala or Medica Singhalensis, that's 80% um, of the, um, the, the, the mixtures or the prescriptions had to have honey, not necessarily taken through mouth, but as I said clearly, what I experienced even as a, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, outside applied thing, how we call it, uh, 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 external uh, treatments. So, so this article by Professor Michel and group, I mean, that's a group of international scientists, six, uh, uh, six of them, I think uh, um, our pollinator 
conservation, Asian pollinator conservation group, and um, should circulate it. I know Dr. Uh, Professor Michelle is very, very helpful, collaborative, and very, very kind. He said, uh, please publish this among your people because people need to know this. And also, uh, especially the beekeepers will have to really think about it. And also the beekeepers are, uh, we, we consider them the protectors of the nature or the stewards of, of the environment. Uh, because without beekeepers, um, because also I've seen in many countries, not uh, unfortunately not in our countries because uh, honey is a, not a big industry compared to growing rice or anything. But um, in Europe and America, the beekeepers are taking to the forefront in protest against the chemical pollution and misuse of um, uh, misuse of uh, agrochemicals, including to their producers, which are really top ranking chemical companies in the world. Of course, that's beside my point, but we all have to understand the producers as well as users, the danger of using this. And um, uh, of course, um, the other things like uh, glyphosate in, um, placental fluid and all that are well discussed and uh, you know that's scary that's very scary and um, so honey situation is not that uh, good either so please keep this in mind and and uh, and uh, and uh, we should really work this uh, uh, this uh, professor michel's group into uh, the asian pollinator group of course he's not a he's a, he's a straight um, uh, chemist kind of a scientist but environmental chemist but um, he, his um, ideas can be very, very good because he has published this uh, remarkable paper. And uh, that, that's why I give this um, reference. Uh, please refer to it. I think you can download from the internet now. Um, so uh, please refer to this, I mean, scary. May I have the next slide, please? Yes, before too late, we have to attempt to bring back the ecosystem to its original position of restoration. So I think all my words and our time and everything, what everybody is doing and including the big impact the Rio conference made uh, to, to, to restore our ecosystem so that we can be healthy back again. And um, can we do that? How do we do this? That's a problem. I mean, everybody can make suggestions. So my humble way in my own farms, I, I have my own farms with coconut, rubber and rice and uh, all the other little, little crops, not too far from where I'm standing. It's just six kilometers from here, where my, uh, my, my grandmother had her beehives. Of course, they were very rudimentary beehives, That's not, not, not the movable frame, but anyway. So uh, finally, after some years of work, um, mm, I, I, I came to reckon honeybees and earthworms as an indicators of small processes and large targets. I mean, these are really good, reliable, easy indicators of this, the so-called small processes and large targets happening in the, the humid tropical uh, rainforest. As you know, rainforest is the biggest uh, living entity on earth. But the processes are small. Same with, I mean, the human race, uh, the, the human species have uh, not practically, they have taken over the, uh, the earth, mother earth. So um, the mother earth uh, lives on small processes, but the targets are large. So I think um, these are very humble, easy, you know, practically just outside our doorstep, you find all these use as indicators, of course, Oh, that's the problem. I mean, what seeing a bee is okay or seeing an earthworm is okay. No, it's not that. Can you go to the next slide, please? Next, yeah, okay. Now, how do you find bees in your garden? Of course, many tropical gardens like mine will have bees, but of course, mine is a little bit different. If you see through the uh, background, there are all build up areas in house in the house that I'm speaking to you right now. But my garden, as you see the ground, you can see I never throw away any dead leaf outside my garden. I always allow them to build up. I almost I always allow them to build up. So wherever I walk, there are stone pavings. 
But wherever I don't walk or wherever there's soil, I never allow soil to be exposed. I always cover with the fallen leaves of the same trees. I have all kinds of trees here. All kinds of trees which I've seen enough and more even in your gardens in Thailand, Indonesia or wherever. So these cover the soil and earthworms will come back because even in a small area, there may be some remnants of uh, rudiments of some earthworm lift and it can multiply or you can bring some um, good soil from outside even a little one to inoculate it. So, but I've been building it for years and, and um, so I fill my, my, my soil in my uh, household property, which is small, uh, is more um, very fertile. And uh, because I, I simply uh, not depend on uh, other things, but only on the biological processes taking place in the soil litter. What is important to me is the first 30 centimeters of uh, soil depth, which is the biologically most active part of the soil. I mean, soil is a, as you know, uh, soil soil is a biological entity, whereas the minerals or sand or something, it's, it's a dead uh, mineral. So bee lining, just to find whether bees are there, all what you have to do is, you know, um, plant the stick and uh, on top of that, put a, some kind of addition, put some honey or sugary liquid. If the honeybees are existing, in a few days they will come because honeybees, I mean, this artificial flower, <laughs> honeybees don't know that uh, <laughs> the humans are offering them some food because honeybees, are, are, as you know, they are you know, opportunistic. I mean, they go to everything, anything or any, everything that has sugar. So, uh, so they might come. So in a few days, sometimes you have to just leave it out. Maybe you should take it inside when there's rain. A honeybee will come and, you know, licking up. So you can be sure when the honeybee is coming, there are bees in the vicinity. And um, because, uh, as you know, the urban urbanized people have not much chance of having uh, environmentally sound um, cultivation types, which is not expected from, um, uh, from the urban folk. I mean, they have to have some flower trees just for to satisfy themselves and, uh, and but you know uh, say suburban or you know semi-urban areas honeybees are still there so this is a good way to see uh, whether the honeybees are existing and we call this bee line in fact if you go on the bee line you can even uh, detect their existing natural or artificial i mean hived colony and uh, so i just want to tell this so so simple can we go to the next one please Yes, now this is just another, you can offer a chunk of um, uh, comb. Of course, I have uh, enough comb because I, I am a beekeeper, but even sugary water is all right. Even after the comb is taken away, still the bees come and lick it up, you know. So they, they, are, they are out and out to look for anything, food, especially in an urban environment, because knowing that their food supply is so limited. So that's uh, just to, you know, clear my point. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. Uh, the, the, the bees are common. We want to keep them common uh, as long as we can. Next one, please. Yes, um, this is something that we, uh, we should take seriously. You know, do all our roadside planting with bee plants. And uh, since of late, uh, I'm very happy, the, 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 especially the, um, uh, uh, advice of the um, people at the environment ministry, um, the, the, the urban uh, authorities are taking uh, serious steps to plant indigenous plants, which are multi-purpose. Now, this is a really um, uh, 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 indigenous plant. It's called uh, Pongamia pinata. I'm sure Pongamia are distributed all over Asia. It's a legume, legume and, um, and this is a street planting just to you know, give a little shade to the car park this car park uh, in heart of Colombo, but still they have planted this. I'm very happy for that decision. In fact, this was brought in a, a kind of a pot. You can see next to the car, the white pot, it's sort of planted. Now the, the, the plant is uh, really well grown and this is in the flowering season. And uh, so there are, you know, multi-purpose plants. I mean, this can help uh, the, the pollin pollinators, uh, uh, you know, with pollen and nectar. And also it helps in beautification. Right? So it's much better that we use a, a, 
uh, indigenous uh, plant, which bees are visiting. I mean, we, we can uh, make a big list of it. I'm sure every country has their list. And um, so especially with the South Asian Pollinary Initiative can make this list uh, published. And um, so we can share our knowledge and our experiences. So this Pongamina, again, a very good medicinal plant, a respected medicinal plant now, fairly common in home gardens and uh, roadside plant. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? Well, this is a Pungamina in flower. Now here in the left-hand side, you can see an Epis dosata as well as an Epis serrana side by side. Because as I said, um, the honeybees are opportunistic. Wherever they can find nectar, they go. And on the right-hand side, there's even Floria, the smallest one, and the Iridipen is so-called the, the stingless honeybee. I mean, they are biting, not uh, they, they are biting honeybees. I'll come to that later. There are also honeybees you could be reared and see all three species in one plant. So that's a very, to me, it's a very versatile plant. And also uh, people can uh, respect this plant. They won't cut it because it's medicinal. So, um, so that's a positive point for us. Next one, please. Yeah, again, the same plant, even a closer look. As you see, it's uh, in the left-hand side, you can see on the, 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 the uh, on the middle of, middle flower, you can see a tiny, uh, tiny uh, trigona iridipennis, and the other one you can see the Episphoria. I just want to tell you this: uh, uh, though the all four species of bees were found at one point at the time I took this photograph, normally the Epis dosata starts very early in the mornings. If you see many trees in the tropics. In the daytime, you don't see any activity, insect activity, and sometimes you wonder whether any insects are coming. The tropical bees, our honeybees, don't forage too well in the hot daylight. It's not that they don't forage, they come even to an artificial dish, but the nectar secretion of these tropical plants are happening in early morning hours, very early morning hours. In fact, just at the uh, dawn, I mean, we can hardly see anything, but you know, especially the dosatas and serana are very busy at the time because they are high resource bees. They come when the resources are full. It's the smaller bees who come to lick up what is remaining and what is left over by the larger bees because maybe their tongue is too not deep enough or whatever. And then especially the trigona come and lick it up. And you can see trigona foraging almost the whole day, whereas the larger bees, the serrana and dosata stops um, almost at the um, 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 early morning. But they, they have worked uh, much, much uh, actively before that, and particularly it is dosata. And there's, uh, I'm sure they are, they are in the folklore, there are so many songs about uh, Epis dosata working in the night, and especially moonlit night, and that's another point. Epis dosata also work in the night if there's moonlight. Maybe go to the next one, please. Yeah, that's the little trigona, and that's rambutang, which is very common in our Asian gardens. Trigona pollinating um, rambutan trees, and the other one, of course, you know, the eggplant or the brinjal or uh, solanum species. And many solanums are uh, pollinated by. Uh, uh, trigona and they are not very good resources for the larger bees so they ignore it but the little um, uh, trigona does it so therefore having trigona is a very advantage they go to all kinds of little flowers sometimes you don't even imagine because they are small ones and small tongue so they're happy with small resources that's the reason trigona is never abscond very hardly ever can you go to the next one please Yeah, of course, the serranas, they go to these uh, large flowers and that's a cucumber, we call it, uh, that's uh, Cucubita maxima, the large cucumber, which is now very common in Asian gardens. And also um, Kerambola, again, very common in our gardens. So they are all require bees and you can see the, uh, the Apis serrana, the, the hive honeybee there. Next one, please. Yes, even in large scale plantations, uh, I mean, cultivations like uh, sesame, serrana and, uh, and uh, onion. I mean, you, they all use serrana, but one has to understand serrana operates at a very 
small close range um, pollinator. So if you really uh, take their pollination range, uh, the effective range of pollination uh, serena is about 300 meters. And as you come down for Floria, it's about 250, 150 meters. When it comes to Iridipenis or Trigona, it's even smaller, like 50 meter radius they forage effectively. So one has to keep in mind. So especially when you're going something like Sesame, uh, can we change this slice, please? Next one, please. Yeah, and um, uh, there are several, several crops um, that um, uh, grown simultaneously in the same area where pollination is essential, like sesame again here. And these are sesame flower with dosata, and that's a sesame field. You know, many farmers like rice growing, they start growing sesame. And that time, they have to time, I mean, not automatically they have uh, timed it. Uh, they have to look for the dosata migration because dosata is not a resident bee. The me bee or the, the serona is a resident bee. They, 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 they have good stores. They are in a protected uh, nesting site or a hive, what we call the human, what the nesting site we give is called a hive just to differentiate between a natural nest and a, uh, a man reared nest. So this is because their uh, foraging range is short. So you need a large pollinator in large numbers. They not only in uh, sesame, even uh, in, in, uh, especially in our rainforest, the, uh, uh, plants like um, uh, uh, Strabilanthus, which is uh, almost 30 species in our cloud forest area, which is very important in protecting the soil, needs uh, dosata coming and pollinating it because they have a, uh, uh, in Latin, you might call it a conucopian flowering. That means flowering in abundance, great abundance. So the resident bees are not enough. So the nature has tuned it so well. At the time, these large crops are flowering. This is, of course, a crop. I mean, so it's a it's a artificial thing. But the farmers have timed it for the time, which they get the good crop. That means the dosata present. When the dosatas migrate to this region, and you can see the mountains uh, the back. So they they migrate about I don't know 100 kilometers to down to the plains. That's the time they grow the Sesame. Now, where the dosata gets back to the mountains, when the mountains, the top of the mountains, have the strobilanthus coming to flower, because so therefore this dosata migration is uh, truly important in especially protecting, conserving the island biodiversity in a small uh, nation like Sri Lanka, which is very, very. I mean, compared to other Asian countries, I think we are one of the smallest, and um, but you know it's uh, teeming with life. And one important thing are these pollinators. Remember, small processes, large targets. Um, next one, please. Yes, I mean, dosatas, um, they have their communal nesting trees. Uh, sometimes they tend to nest together in one large tree. And, um, you know, these are rather common. I've seen similar things in in uh, all the all Asian countries I visited. And uh, people have respect to them in spite of their notorious fierceness. People don't mess around them. They don't bother about people and they do their natural duty and keep all happy. So we want to keep all happy, the bees and the humans and our, our health. Next one, please. Yes, you know, traditionally, like my grandmother, still our villagers, you know, keep when they have a broken pot, they don't just throw away the pot. They try to sort of um, put it in a hive. And this young lady, she's with a new young family and uh, medicine is important for her ch ch children. So she has very wisely placed in uh, two pots, one covering the other. So I removed the other one, I got her to remove it and uh, she removed it, you can see the nest inside. I mean, it's very common. I mean, of course, this is coming from a very good farming area. It's not an urban area. There are uh, at least one hectare of uh, uh, farmland for them. And as you see, if you divide the Sri Lankan population with our available land area, uh, we hardly ever get um, uh, one tenth of a hectare. So that's very small land. So one has to really intensify. Intensification does not mean intensification of the chemical use, but it's an in intensification of the cultivation pattern, which we really have to invest. 
and 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 uh, uh, invent. Uh, we have to uh, put some sufficient money and reinvent. I mean, just not planting. I mean, we have to take all factors, agronomic and every factor for that. So I will not um, go into that detail, but we really have to uh, use um, a different approach. Uh, the, the conservation of biodiversity and feeding the hungry human belly, so which are both important. Can you go to the next one, please? Yes, and also this is a, a hive that we developed re recently. No, this is a uh, it's called a horizontal hive. Uh, in Africa, this is very, uh, can you go back please uh, for a minute? Yeah, uh, this is a horizontal hive uh, where the colonies uh, um, uh, managed to develop horizontally. So therefore very little management as such. You, you can have enough space and enough top bars for the movable uh, combs. And uh, this is one um, thing that we, you know, we introduced very recently, especially from my institute and my own work. Uh, because this I, it looks very suitable because it demands very little um, management compared to the other one. Can we go to the next one? Next one, please. Yeah, these are regular one that like in uh, West or Europe or America, where you have special areas for honey called super or honeycombs and a special area for the uh, brood. But even the other one I showed you, you uh, through management, you can make these special uh, differences and very, uh, uh, very little um, investment on it. And also uh, that is relatively less costly than the one because uh, Sri Lanka has a problem of, uh, of uh, wood now. And uh, so um, we have to um, sort of uh, uh, really conserve the wood in making hives. Next one, please. Yes, also trigona, you can uh, rear them easily. I mean, you don't need to and movable combs because they are comb building or uh, the, now this is on the right hand side is the brood and left hand side is the pollen and the um, and the uh, uh, honey and uh, you can have some little honey apparently some people claim that uh, especially the uh, the epitherapy group claim the these are more medicinal than the uh, uh, the, the regular honeybee the stinging honeybee honey these are called the stingless because they bite they don't sting so um, Anyway, that's not our point. Our point is, my point is, they are good home garden pollinators and easy to keep them. And um, because they nimble on very, very limited resources. So they are there practically permanently. And rearing them is very easy, but the value addition is higher, especially in your vegetable garden. Next one, please. Yeah, they are everywhere. In fact, uh, this is a Malaysian journal called Nature, Nature Malaysiana. I got it as far back in 1987 or 88 when I visited Malaysia. There was a, a nice scientist working in the uh, University of Patanian in Zeradang, uh, very n uh, close to, uh, 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 to, to, to um, Kuala Lumpur, KL. And uh, in the agriculture university, there was a scientist working on this bees. Uh, but this is the other one is from Sri Lanka. Um, from one of our backyards. So trigona is very common, but you can rear them and easy to work with them. Next one, please. Yes, uh, also po um, coconut pollination, that is something that we have to take up seriously. Uh, we have a problem of um, bringing enough coconuts. And also we have a big problem um, imposed by the oil palm industry. <laughs> Oil palm oil is cheaper than coconut oil, and coconut uh, uh, areas are depleting, whereas uh, oil palm areas are increasing. But that's not a um, problem to us; it's a problem to I think Malaysian and Indonesian uh, countries. Um, I've read a lot about uh, orangutan conservation and all that, and apparently oil palm is uh, blamed a lot for that. And um, but anyway, uh, I'm demonstrating to people how the pollination takes place and to have bees and everything uh, uh, in their gardens, this uh, short flight range ones. So we conduct classes and also at this age of mine, I had to climb trees and show them, but here I don't climb a tree. I'm standing on a platform, but these are this has to be demonstrated because coconut pollination also not very simple. Uh, some um, um, uh, little mites uh, called 
new cipher elapse. I mean, there's a very tiny mite. You can see the role of the bees are to carry the mites. Apparently, the mites do the um, pollination. I'm not going to take uh, your time on this, but uh, uh, this is something that we all see that increase the coconut yields, you know, whatever the way, because that's, that's another way to protect the uh, rainforest of Malaysia and Indonesia. I think beginners who want more money and more profit, but uh, I mean, we have cook, uh, palm oil even here, which are cheaper than coconut oil. But uh, personally, we prefer coconut oil. It's tasty, at least, at least for us. So coconut pollination um, uh, is something that we have to really uh, take seriously. And since of uh, recent times, we are doing it here. Next one, please. Yes. So getting back to the earthworms, now we talked a lot about bees. So we have to really make an estimate. Now, this is a farm in the very near the rainforest. It's a rainforest country. As you see, you can see the very, very eroded, uh, you know, practically brown soil. Normally the rainforest soils are all black with a lot of, uh, uh, lot of debris. And, and uh, uh, but here, uh, this young lady wants to start a farm, but unfortunately, uh, um, uh, it was eroded. So at least um, now they're serious, they're having uh, retention bonds so that there's a contour bonding. And uh, we are just making the estimate of it. All what we do is we dig up a hole. And uh, of course, a measured, uh, normally we do it 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter hole. And we go down 30 centimeters. The next one, please. And uh, at, uh, um, we take the soil in two different layers. First 15 centimeter and the next 15 centimeter. And we sieve the soil with a 10 millimeter and a five millimeter sieve to uh, count the earthworms one by one. Uh, next one, please. So this lady and yeah, so that's the sieving and you collect the earthworms and all the other things like um, scarab uh, beetle larvae, you know, scarab beetle larvae are also very important in recycling thing. There are others, termites, scarabid larvae, um, uh, columbolans, and there are so many about at least uh, seven different types of, um, uh, I would say, invertebrates are important in this. But earthworm is one of the most reliable and a good indicator. So we are collecting earthworms. Next one, please. Yes. So finally, um, in this, um, uh, uh, volume of soil that is 50 by 50 and um, uh, 30 centimeter deep. We were able to catch um, uh, more than 40, 40, 40 um, earthworms per square meter. When you translate it into square meters, more than 40, which is uh, at least in our situation with the data I have now is the minimum allowed. Any soil with less than 40 Earthworms per square meter, I would say you are in trouble because your soil is highly non-biological. It's not biological anymore because it should be teeming with earthworms. I mean, you can see the difference. If you go to a soil with a summer with a lot of cow dung that has a lot of earthworms, I mean, running into hundreds and sometimes several hundreds. So that's a really a lively, a vibrant soil. So, but here, this is just past the minimum. So obviously she understood. And we did a, another thing in the rainforest nearby that has a very high number, but I, can't, I don't remember it, but quite a high number. So, she, I mean, there itself I have shown, look lady, now you have to really manage your farm in such a way, control erosion and add more leaf litter into your system and the earthworms will come back. And one of the easiest ways to adding cow dung because cow dung is a very well pulverized uh, cellulose material. Next one, please. Yes, and um, also, especially um, performance of a bee colony. I used a little bit um, uh, uh, different methods because I believe in not disturbing the bees uh, inside, not too frequently. That's one of the mistakes we do. We try to poke our, you know, poke too much into the hives, which bee, bees don't like. And also, as you have seen, the Asian beekeeping, one of the problems is the very quick absconding or leaving the hive uh, 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 without any warning. 
uh, you know, that kind of things results when the bees are being disturbed too much. So what I do is I uh, keep the colonies on a uh, electronic balance. In the sense, these balances are made by me. Uh, and I'm sure in the Thailand and, and all this uh, South Asian markets, uh, uh, there's a thing called a load cell. Load cell is the principle behind electronic balances. You can buy the uh, load cell to the capacity you need. I need a 30 kilo maximum uh, load cell. And I keep uh, many of my uh, important colonies or, or, or my study colonies on them so I can monitor uh, morning and day weight changes. That is a good indicator of the the, the, their weight gains, whether they're foraging, you know, especially when I go to the forest, uh, I have to monitor the forest, what's happening in the forest, what's the season. So there are, those are a little bit, um, not too complicated, but it'll take our time and uh, pollen analysis and all that kind of thing, because you have to, um, then it's, it's very easy to identify plant. I think I want to make a request to the, again, to the South Asian Pollinator Alliance that uh, we have to do a coordinator, coordinated study of the pollen flow to, uh, to beehives at various locations. So we can really build the pollen atlas for the region, which is very important, which is very important. At the same time, simultaneously, earthworm uh, populations in each uh, forest types, and we can come out with very valuable data, very valuable data uh, in the long run for our, our children and our grandchildren to be educated and, uh, you know, put their thinking into it, but it's also very simple, very simple. I mean, we can get the farmers involved in it. Of course, the farmers may not bother about this electronic balances, but at least having uh, a bee colony, say every five farmers or whatever, say every hectare, there's a bee colony, you know, hectare means I think several farmers. So that's a good indicator, something like that. So, uh, and you know, keep that in mind. We keep that pro promoting that kind of a thing. Next one, please. Yes, you compare with undisturbed habitat. That's all what you do. You first evaluate your habitat and um, then you go to a similar eco-climatic region. See uh, that, that young lady I'm working and the man, um, you know, they had a forest patch just uh, 100 uh, meters away. So we did the same digging and, uh, you know, they understood the the, 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 you know, they immediately understood. I mean, I don't even have to explain. Now they are really thinking very seriously. This is our natural thing. And that's the one that gives the highest productivity. And as you know, still uh, people uh, live close to forest, live a lot by the forest. They get their sugar, as you know, the sugar palm or caryota and many things from the forest, their medicine and everything. So forest is, a, as, as we always say in our, um, especially the, uh, uh, the Buddhistic countries, which are many in this region. The forest is a very kind entity that um, gives kindness uh, to every person, including the one who carries an ax to destroy the forest. So anyway, we have, we have to see less people destroy, but you know, people live by the forest. So they, they don't uh, destroy as uh, badly. I mean, cutting a forest tree for medicine or a branch, you know, that's uh, quite okay. But if it's a big timber salesman, uh, a big big timber merchant coming and cutting off forest, that's not the that's beyond the limit. So that's something. So you have to make uh, the beekeepers will give a, a high value to a living tree. With our pollinator uh, alliance, this is the value that we have to. This is the uh, message that we have to convey to the beekeepers and to the farmers. Living trees have a value, not a dead tree. Living trees have a, 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 a continuous value, perpetual value, whereas the dead tree is dead, that's it. So uh, this is a message I think uh, we all should attempt to take. And then the forest planting, the, the, the road planting, home garden planting, all can have some kind of a thinking component to the, the, the bees, not necessarily honeybees, so bringing back the bees. I mean, I talked about honeybees because I work more with the honeybees than with the solitary bees. Of course, I do work with solitary bees. For instance, passion pollination, you have to have the Silocopa, the large bee. And uh, Malaysians have been doing, uh, I remember University of Britannian had a team working on passion pollination on the solitary bees. So therefore, I mean, coming back to it, we have to 
uh, get the farmers, uh, the small farmers. I mean, most of the farmers in our region are small farmers. And um, the, the importance of honeybees and earthworms in a very practical sense, and their, uh, uh, their, 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 their simpleness, I mean, their commonness. Uh, it's not, uh, you're not talking something they cannot see. You're talking something they can just see outside their window. So um, I think that's, uh, that I feel is a, a step in the right direction, if you want to say that way. So um, uh, though they are, you know, <laughs> zoologically not related, but in this instance, they are very related and very dear. Next one, please. Yes, okay. With that, uh, I conclude my little presentation. I hope I, my time, of course, I'm showing up uh, since I put on my recorder one, one hour, 10 minutes. Uh, I believe, Michael, we have still time for questions and answering. Yeah, yeah, please. I think we're a little bit later. So I think uh, if you either want to put it on the Skype or on the, uh, the chat. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, but also, if you want to raise, raise your hand, uh, I'm happy to let you speak. And maybe you can turn on your, your camera and you can say who you are. And, and, and then we can hear from you as well. But we can have some interaction before we conclude this. So I don't see if I have, I don't see any questions yet up now or anyone with their hand raised. So if any would like to join and we would welcome the, hope, the, the whole thing is not a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, sometimes that can happen. Or I mean, I guess I see from Spencer, uh, but I think it seems like a question to everyone. Having a beehive map in Thailand or across the region will be good. Can we work on it? Uh, not sure. I think that seems like to work on it. I know Spencer, is there something specifically to follow up from there? Or anyone else have any questions? Please uh, raise your hand, or or uh, feel free to type in the chat box. Or is it, is it, okay, all right, Spencer. Okay, Spencer, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just kind of like an echo to what, um, again, thank you, to Dr. Punchi Hiwat for the sharing. Um, the, the things uh, he mentioned about having a, you know, beehive map, you know, the weight and, and monitoring, you know, the, the regional beehive uh, colony, I think this is a good idea. But, uh, and then there's a scientific uh, technology available. Uh, just wondering whether people are interested in looking into it um, to, to get get going and how to get it going. Um, am I to answer or some you're looking for the audience? Uh, well, um, yeah, please, doctor, if you can share your thoughts yeah, on the that's area. That's kind of, a, it's nothing novel, but um, um, I find that's a very easy way uh, and also very accurate way. Because um, as you know, Serana really freezes if you work with a hive. I mean, they, they for some time, they become, uh, you know, lazy and, and wouldn't go out of the hive and they, 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 they are, their behavior is quite different. But yeah, as you, uh, perhaps you know, Malifera can take a lot of misuse, I mean, or abuse. I mean, you can pound on a hive, nothing will happen. You can just work and smoke. But whereas Serana tends to be a little bit more sensitive or, or shy. So uh, having this is a better way to monitor. And also, um, uh, I don't know whether I have sent you my book. My book is available free. I can send you the link and you can get it. And there I have devised a technique of um, uh, measuring the colony performance just by counting pollen carrying bees, which is very easy. And you don't have to, in fact, it should be done on an undisturbed hive. You shall not disturb the hive at all. Because these are, you know, really um, the, 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 their reaction to um, uh, the beekeeper and to the smoke is uh, very, very, very quick. And uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, one has to be least uh, bothering the bees as much as possible. Of course, management means uh, humans, we are interfering with them, but we should interfere in such a way it's not detrimental to us and to the bees. So um, uh, there's a, this morning, there's a certain period. I think uh, practically every region, at least I've done this in Philippines and um, Indonesia, 
Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and Burma, all these countries, um, including Sri Lanka, the, the pollen carrying bees are the highest between 8 to um, 10.30 or 11 a.m. in the morning hours. So at that time, if you count the relative number of pollen carrying bees, that will tell the, uh, the health uh, or the performance of the colony. So um, I can send you the link and it's very well explained in that book. And, um, and this is also a very simple thing for a beekeeper. I mean, beekeeper shall not, uh, you know, poke in the, you know, to the beehive too often. And uh, uh, so that will make the bees. And also, the, you know, it's a nuisance to the bees and to the beekeeper. You, you can't be poking, uh, you know, disturbing hive too often. And we wouldn't like it. So um, that's a way. But, you know, the electronic thing is another thing because you ha also have to have a monitor. You know, it doesn't register the weight like in a, in a regular commercial balance. You have to have so many load cells under everything. You go a certain time of the morning and check into your, your, your monitor and that gives the weight and you record down. Of course, there are other things where you can automatically transfer them, but uh, you not have to worry. You know, if you're a beekeeper, if you're a farmer working in the garden, it's so much easier than having a, in the, a separate uh, a display for each uh, balance. But maybe we, we should work with your program, the Asian Pollinator Initiative, and you know try to propagate this at least in central places so that we can study an area better. Or one one uh, so-called uh, we call it a agro eco region. I mean, uh, not everywhere, but uh, you may be having some you know districts or whatever. But they, they are different from political and uh, administrative demarcations. But every uh, you know. Uh, similar homogeneous uh, area. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I guess I'd like to follow up with something, uh, Dr. Punchewa. I was uh, within the monitoring of the indicators of earthworms, you had a kind of a clear method that was simple. If we're monitoring uh, honeybees and to see if our, our farm ecosystem is healthy, do you have any more advice on counting? Just, I can say in my own personal case, I'm not in as wet a tropical area as you are. So uh -huh. I noticed that the honeybees are cyclical. We have a lot yeah. more like dorsata is just starting to come now as we're getting into a certain uh -huh. flowering period and so forth. Uh -huh. I, I see the, the stingless bees year round. And then there's yeah. uh, in, the, in the rainy season, actually, when there's not a lot of big flowering, we actually have a lot more butterflies. Uh, but yes. fewer uh, of this. So how would I say and then like count to see if we have a, a poor population or a healthy population or to monitor that what is a acceptable number or a good number? Um, if you have a beehive in your garden, so much easier. If you don't have one, look for a neighbor who has some bees. And with him, because you, then you don't have to make a special attempt on that. And obviously farmers in a region, uh, neighbors are knowing each other. And um, just give him the idea and you go close to the hive and take a count every week or something like that. You know, that takes a few minutes, less than the time you take to walk to his garden. And um, so you can do that. I mean, in fact, I call it a CPI called Colony Performance Index. Very simple measure. I send you the, uh, the copy of the book and you can just see it, how it is working. And easy for people to okay. understand. Unfortunately, it's in English and, and in our own language, which is English copies available all over. So um, that's, uh, that's one way that we can, uh, we can do it. But also, um, uh, if you have this uh, very easy to rare trigona, the stingless bees, so if you hive them in a box where you can open every now and again to see, and also, I mean, you can even have that on a, you know, one of these uh, load cells, uh, uh, but you know, they're very, very, very uh, small, uh, tiny little thing. They are hardly ever abscond, but you can see the population growing or shrinking just by looking at them. And uh, these are very simple indicators. I mean, if you go for instrumentation and counting, uh, that's different. Also, to add to the point that uh, Spencer brought up, uh, you know, um, uh, mapping the bee colonies, very good idea. See, now the GPS, uh, 
are available in a practically my iPhone has and uh, you can buy a, um, um, I mean, just, a, I mean, even this um, uh, uh, GPS is like a, uh, Garmin, uh, Garmin Jeep is uh, rather cheap and available and very accurate. Mm. So you, you can give an international address to each point, each place where you are monitoring. And as you know, now there are very accurate, rather accurate, I have not used it though, maps developed by uh, top bot botanical institutes like uh, uh, Missouri Botanical Gardens and Harvard uh, uh, Plant Science Department, where you can see from the satellite uh, the, 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 the types of plants. And uh, I was told that uh, it's so accurate now, so, so much refined, you can even identify the species of plants. Mm. I'm sure these are very expensive and you know out of our reach. Neither I worry about it. I would rather go by foot and see the plant. <laughs> but uh, these are available. But if you give a, with, a, with a very, very cheap and very effective, very accurate GPS apparatus, you can give an international address and I can see the place from here or anywhere. And uh, so uh, I think uh, I, I would uh, you know go further and suggest that in your experimental farm itself, you know, if you have these um, things and uh, you can monitor the surrounding and, and the health of the community. And, uh, you know, these are all integrated things and eventually you share the experiences so people will be concerned. Now, uh, a good example is some, some time ago, about a, 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 10 years ago, uh, our municipalities never collected the garbage effectively. Sometimes, you know, garbage uh, practically everywhere. But now people are very serious and they, they collect properly and, and they recycle. Uh, so, you know, these good things are coming. I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people tend to uh, picture a gloomy picture, you know, paint a gloomy picture, but um, I, I'm rather optimistic. You know, people uh, uh, take it up if it is usable, user-friendly. Okay. And uh, so, you know, my earthworms and honeybees are user friendly. Yeah, no, <laughs> sounds, 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 sounds great. I guess I, I pass to another question here. We've got from uh, Jonathan So from Malaysia. He wants to know yeah. whether there's any competition between Apis serrana and uh, Trigona itama, which is a species there. Where they compete yeah. against each other and uh, attack each other's hive. Is this a risk or? Yes, there is a competition. I, you know, competition comes when the resources are limited. So, but you know, there are ways of uh, keeping uh, each other out. In the competition, Trigona wins. You know, the, the, the smaller bees win because they have a very, very effective defense because they're small, so they have to really defend. So uh, there's competition. There's a competition for food and it's well documented. Uh, some of the earliest experiments are conducted in Sri Lanka itself by my teacher, Tioniga, I saw back, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, those papers are available. So uh, Dosara is the worst. They, they go out of the picture very soon because they are high resource bees, whereas Trigona is a low resource bee. So they scavenge on whatever the little left. So they, they give a good fight also to the larger bees. So I believe, uh, I mean, Malaysia has a lot of, lot of, uh, large number of stimulus bees. I mean, obviously they are in the center of Apis, uh, Apis origin. So they have very large number of bees. So um, there's a competition, definitely there's a competition and uh, uh, large bees lose all the time. But that again comes uh, from the time of uh, uh, the resource. So you have to really, the both bees could be managed. So if you sort of a, Prime them with a little uh, extra food, they'll, they'll be okay. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it looks like we don't have other questions coming from our participants now. I don't know if uh, Dr. Munchehaya, you want to have any last remarks or questions you want to hear from, and we have a lot of interesting people joining today or things for us to think about as we're also approaching the um, end of the evening time. Yeah, I think I made it, uh, very simple. I mean, it is simple. My techniques are all, all, all my work is very simple. It's for the farmer because I'm a farmer myself. I do it myself with my own hands in my own farm. So it has to be simple. Um, 
I like to sort of um, uh, generate an interest group among the, perhaps uh, your farm can take the lead and uh, there you sort of, um, information sharing is the key word. You know, my inf what are the information I gathered and what you have, what you have generated in your farm, if this could be shared and it could be for the betterment of the, all the people in our areas. Uh, because uh, I mean, just now the need of the day is new technology. I, I don't mean the, the, the so-called the, the, the unreachable technology. I mean, remember once one time ago, people want to spray um, pesticide with um, ultra low volume. I mean, that's a great idea. They say no drift and no that this and the other, but the instruments and the precision of the spray are immensely important. I mean, I remember, you know, I also thought, oh, it's a great idea. So you're not uh, wasting any pesticide, especially uh, you are preventing the drift to the maximum. But, you know, finally you're spraying a very toxic chemical in a very concentrated volume. I mean, there were all positive points, low volume and uh, very accurate and this micro, you know, uh, mist and, you know, a lot of positive points, technologically very advanced. But on the ground, um, it intensified the problem. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I think we have to network. I think that's a very good thing that uh, especially you started with me. And I think you must take the lead to sort of uh, bring together all the workers, I mean, uh, uh, in the region. So we can exchange ideas and especially uh, in spite of, uh, you know, the, you know, air travel is expensive now. Even otherwise, air travel is expensive. It's not for many of us. I mean, I used to travel because somebody else will fund my travel, <laughs> but I don't have that luxury anymore, neither I'm interested. So, but, you know, because of the good internet and um, our exchange of ideas and uh, electronic mailing and, uh, I mean, we can be still working together very closely. And uh, maybe we can make farm visits one time and still uh, our uh, audience can see them and, and, and get ideas and discuss it. Okay, th thank and you. I know, uh, sure. Yeah, there are a lot of videos going on now, but you know, sometimes um, they are just videos. There isn't much, <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of people present many things, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, they are kind of fakeish. I would say <laughs> I don't want to insult anybody, but you know it's just a video. There is no substance to it. So therefore, I think if an organization does it, so that means they are edited material. I mean, with the with the with the cyber world, you can put anything, any information, whether verified or unverified or edited or unedited. But if a central per, uh, organization does it, that means there is some surety that this is all authentic material. I think that's something uh, your organization, uh, the green, uh, forgot, I forgot the name, but what you should do because then there's authenticity and the people uh, trust that. The trust is important because they, otherwise there's a, a misinformation uh, is, is a big crime. Okay. Well, I think you're, you're right on with, I think, a lot of uh, opportunity and for everyone else joining, uh, I think we want to see where this can go. And I think I'd like to hear maybe more voices of experience from different people. I think this is helpful. And I think uh, I know a lot of names and faces here of other people who are, are working on these key issues. Uh, I think for today, I'm really uh, thankful to hear from you. And I'd like to pass uh, to, to, to Franz to Moody to help uh, give a final thanks and to help close the session and see maybe where we can go from here. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so um, I saw one question from Jonathan uh, So from Malaysia. Um, he was asking about more technical uh, support, how to form a PC runner. So I think I would also recommend um, everybody to download um, the book of Dr. Punchi. I send the link on the chat box. It was the courtesy of the library for, of University of Sri Jawadarapura in Sri Lanka. I think in the book, I, I checked there is a more like a bit technical how to, to farm the bee, also to do honey harvesting. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, for today, yeah, I think we learned a lot um, from what Dr. Punchi has shared. Um, many interesting, then I think um, definitely we have to thank Dr. Punchi. Yeah, Bohoma Stuti. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Bohoma Stuti. I just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and oh, I, good. so I think um, we should keep this network um, bigger, also spread the news yeah. to uh, other people because uh, I think this kind of information is worth sharing. So we can also learn from experiences in other country like from Vietnam, Indonesia. So I think Michael and Spencer and the team also with Sil and from WWF, we have this idea to plan for more talks. So we also welcome if you have idea uh, who, or maybe yourself could be a, a, a share what you have been doing as a speaker. Please feel free to write us the email. I think we, we yeah. can share the email, yeah, whom to contact. Um, yeah, also so, so um, remind, if you want to join us, um, our Facebook page, please uh, type tiny.cc slash APIA, or you can also find in Facebook APIA, the Asia Pollinator Initiatives uh, Alliance. Does anybody have something to add? Maybe Spencer, you want to you to add some closing? Oh, um, thank you, thank you, Frank. Um, yes, I, I, I echoed what uh, Dr. Tapuncha was saying. I think we are trying to build the communities in here. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge and experience in different places, but it's all scattered around. I think if, if anyone um, want to discuss any topic or wants a deeper, Con connections with certain um, expert and I would like to have some webinars introduce certain topic, please feel free to uh, drop us the uh, comment on the Facebook or contact us and we'll try to find the appropriate person. Or on the other hand, if, if uh, someone who are expert in certain areas in beekeeping in here and you would like to share your knowledge that you're handling beekeeping within your local community, within your species, or the, the issue you're facing during climate changes or the, any other issues, uh, please feel to, um, again, um, contact us and we'll arrange um, some form of meetings or webinars and sharing your information out. Thank you. Thanks, I guess they can go. I guess also one other thing, I think Doc, Dr. Punchi, you said that you will have more information on your website, but it's not up yet, right? You're putting a bunch of information not up yet on the- Because one of my website engineers have fallen sick and um, you know he's sort of undoing what could not be done. So therefore, um, <laughs> there's a backlog uh, on him. So I said, I'm not in a hurry, but do it proper. So that's where oh. we stand, but we'll be opening it soon. Hopefully yeah. Too. yeah. Uh, another note that we've been trying to work is that all these knowledge may be in different languages. Unfortunately, we're all using English as a communication medium. And with internet, yeah. with the um, you know, uh, digital technology, it's possible to do uh, language translations through the online platform. I think this is more beneficial to the local farmers if they are not speaking English or, or, or uh, an area. And if there's a need in this area, Again, let's work on something for your local farmers. Um, we will work out all the technicalities in terms of translations. And um, again, the, the knowledge needs to be um, propagated. You know, that's our wish of the API. Thank you. Yeah, knowledge needs to be propagated. Yes, I 100% agree with you. Uh, it's not for libraries, but for us. <laughs> All right. I guess I guess we you can know, close. But if you want to have a can you, can you have a conversation? It's welcome. You can stay on. But I think in terms of the the scope of what we were trying to cover. But I think if it's if there's no problem if people want to continue to talk. But I think in terms of what we had hoped to do, this is. Yeah, uh, I think we, we we took a long time, and I'm sure people want to listen to something else. <laughs> all right. All so right. we wind up with that. Okay. So for everybody, greetings and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, we'll meet some other time. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye.
Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.